As a Protestant looking into and genuinely considering converting to Orthodoxy, I'm already making plans to leave my church. There's just one thing I can't get over because of how much it's been drilled into my head over and over. How can you, as a Christian, make images of holy things like Christ and not consider it idolatry or consider it not directly going against what God told us in the second commandment to not make graven images. Exodus 20 verse 4, you shall not make for yourself an idol or a likeness of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters beneath the earth. So, I mean, I think the, the question is so sincere and beautiful first that has to be said. One, I, you'd be hard pressed just to start with something. We'll talk about the theology of it, but just to start, you're a little hard pressed to say that Jesus is a, 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 any like picture of him or something is graven. Like if we've got a good definition of graven, I don't think Jesus would fall under it. But to get back to what the scripture says, the theology of it all. Well, and you can do the Old Testament just with the temple decorations, like what they what they had them, like how to decorate the the temple, it was all images and things, but okay, graven images. So we don't have any icons of like a calf, golden calf raised up to bow down to or something. When the creator of the universe, the second person of the Trinity, the son, who was with the father before all the ages, without beginning, son of the father, when he out of love for mankind, to save us from our sins and to show us the Father, enters into his creation, it's mind-blowing, becomes a baby, not like finds a human and kind of like encourages the human to be Christ-like. God, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, becomes a human person. Two natures, fully divine, fully human, one person. Two natures, one person. Absolutely incredible. Like, more reflections needed, not less. More, more is needed. When he enters into matter and takes on flesh, it shows us that, like, we have to rethink about what matter even is, that it can now be filled with the presence of God. And that God, like, walked the earth and ate the fish and the honey and, like, you know, got sweaty, like, lived lived in his world, fully part of it, and even maybe along with the greatness of that, ascends into heaven, taking humanity with him. You know, he rises from the dead. He doesn't leave the body behind. They know he's risen because he's physically risen, not just kind of some spiritual thing. If matter now is like can take on some of the divinity of God, just not not speaking now of Christ, but like of the earth. We say when Jesus stepped into the waters to be baptized, the waters were changed. Not Jesus was changed. The waters were changed. He did something to it. When we think about like icons, we don't think of them as graven images. They're certainly not grave. They're not graven images. That's for sure. They're not that. But I think it's still right as a Protestant to question and to ask like showing any of your veneration. For us, we don't worship the, the, the wood. We don't, we're not showing any kind of deference to the paint. It's not the paint that we're all about or the wood that we're all about. We definitely show respect to the, to the actual material item, but it's not the worship of the thing. It's the worship of the one or veneration of the one that's represented in the, in the icon. So any veneration showed to the icon of Christ, we say and teach Christ accepts as veneration to himself. So it's not that the thing becomes the thing of worship. It's the one who's depicted, you know, who it's, we call them windows into heaven. You know, you, you're, you're getting like, you're getting to see. And I would say this too, Maybe, I don't know if I've said enough about that. There's, probably, there's a lot that can be said. And without St. John of Damascus here to help me, forgive me, but I would add this. That question, if it's, I am interested in orthodoxy, I love everything about it, except I have this one question that holds me back. I would tell you that if you've gotten down to having one problem, 
like everything else is great, but I have this one issue. I would tell you like, you don't need, there's no rush to convert. Like they got to convert by Monday or something. I would say go and learn and live the life of orthodoxy, be in the parish, you know, do your prayers and see if you can trust the church with, I mean, if you can trust the church with the, all the teachings, I mean, the Bible itself, like if you can trust the church with everything, give it time, you'll, you'll learn and you'll trust the church with this too. You'll see that even though it was drilled into you as a kid, that, I mean, people, I mean, unless you've gone totally without any symbol at all in Christianity, whatever you were raised in, the Christian version you were raised in, unless it's all been erased, there's still some symbol somewhere. And the big, big, big difference for orthodoxy is that the symbol is connected to the reality it represents. So before orthodoxy, we would say things like, it's just a symbol. We, when you're orthodox, you don't say it's just a symbol because any veneration showed to the icon of Christ, Christ, the one depicted in the icon, accepts the veneration as veneration of himself. The one depicted in the icon, which is a symbol, I mean, the icon is not Jesus. It's a piece of wood, with paint. It's been prayed for, prayed with, and then worked on. It's not the thing itself that's being worshiped. It's the Lord depicted in it. And we, we, man, we need to see things. But anyway, that's a whole thing. But the symbol is connected to the reality it represents. So for us, this isn't a thing unto itself, like the golden calf in Exodus. Moses goes up on the mountain, comes down, and finds out they'd melted everything down and built some kind of calf for worship. It is the Lord. And if he has become a man, if God, the word has become a man, then he can be depicted in, I mean, he's a real person, not just like an imaginary person or something. He's real and he's actually can be depicted. I mean, we have saints today that are photographed, you know, photographed. Like we have color photographs of saints, you know, it's not just like random, like get under the hood with the black thing, you know, the big bulbs. It's like people are taking pictures with their cell phones of saints nowadays. So if they can be depicted because they're real and human, then they can be the icons. I mean, the icons can be done of them. So again, the icons are not worshiped, but any veneration shown to them, people kiss them. You know, it's like, you know, it is different than like having pictures of your family, but it's not, it's not radically different than having pictures of your family and showing love to them. So I don't know. I hope that's helpful. I certainly probably haven't said enough of the theology, but to understand, I mean, to get back to the actual question is I have this one thing. If that's the truth, run as fast as you can to the Orthodox church and learn. And, and, and maybe that will be the thing that the Lord has to you have to learn. You have to read what the Orthodox say about it. You've heard everything that your former church said about it. Now read and listen and learn what the Orthodox church says about it. One of those things will be true and one will be false. That is, that's the way it will go. One of those teachings will be true and one will be false. If you trust the church with everything, you'll trust this, but you, I honestly, I think you could, I could even like say, if you were a person of mine, I'd say, do all the reading and I'll leave it up to you because it's, it's manifest, it's obvious. All right, the next question is, do you believe the tongues that are spoken today in churches, such as Pentecostal or charismatic churches, are the same tongues that were spoken by the apostles and very first Christians that were around? And in charismatic and Pentecostal churches, the congregation openly speaks tongues. Do you believe that this is wrong if 1 Corinthians 14 verses 27 through 28 clearly states that we should not do this? If the question is, the tongues spoken today in Pentecostal churches, are those the same that were spoken in Acts? I think it's easy to say that they're not. I mean, it seems obvious that they're not. I don't know anyone that speaks in tongues that speaks the language they, they didn't know and that there's people around that are hearing about the glory of God from it. People have like a prayer language or something. I mean, it would be, this would be a, a more difficult question if someone said something like that. But if the question is, are the tongues spoken today the same as those spoken at Pentecost? No, they're not. Because the ones spoken at Pentecost, 
Everyone from all over the world was hearing the gospel in the language they understood. So I would believe it 100% if you traveled to Russia and didn't know any Russian and the Lord gave you the ability to speak and understand Russian without having learned it. Then it's like, yeah, tongues, fully. I think what's happened today or what we see is because it's a, you know, we talk about like the Orthodox prayer bypassing the brain and going to the heart. This kind of tongues thing bypasses the brain, but not in a good way. You know, it's like there's no understanding. And it does seem like scripture talks about that you shouldn't give a word without understanding. So it has to be interpreted. St. Paul, in the list of spiritual gifts, tongues is on the bottom. Tongues is not at the top. He, he says, you know, he's glad he's got it or whatever. But, you know, he was the one that was preaching the gospel basically for the first time everywhere. You know, we go to the, you go to Greece or somewhere. It's like St. Paul was here. St. Paul was there. St. Paul was here and all over and People are sincere and of goodwill, and I don't think it's all demonic, but it wouldn't be fair to say that none of it is demonic. Like, it's too... And if it leads to repentance, there could be something in it, but that's not usually what you see. So, but if the, if the question is kind of simply, is it the same? It's clearly not the same. Like, it just simply isn't the same, you know? And the Spirit can come on people and do whatever the Spirit wants, but usually these things aren't being led by the spirit and spirit born. They're something else. Best advice for a Roman Catholic that wants to convert to Orthodox Christianity. Uh, it's first off, that's, that, uh, it starts very simply like, go to the Orthodox Church. Like find the one that's closest to you or whatever. You know, I'm an Antiochian priest. If you, they need to probably, a Roman Catholic needs to visit. If they're interested in Orthodoxy, they just need to visit an Orthodox Church. Go a couple of times, send an email to the priest, say hello, ask if you can sit down. You know, if someone were here in Phoenix, they would come and we do this all the time and it's happening. We have lots of catechumens right now and lots of people we've baptized this year and some of them are Roman Catholics and they, they come and we go through a catechumen class. So they they start attending, they go through the catechumen class. Sometimes it takes a year or so and, you know, it depends on the local parish and what people have and what priest can do. I would add, maybe I'll add this, and it's not so much exactly to that question, but just as a, a, a follow-up. When people are coming to Orthodoxy, often it's because they're frustrated from where they, where they are right now, where they've been raised, or how things are going, or something they read in the news, or whatever, and they get fired up, and they're like, I'm going to leave this place. I'm going to go to the Orthodox Church. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, like, that's the way we are. We do, we do that. So we, we turn, and we, we run to the Orthodox Church, but once you get to the Orthodox Church, at some point that fire that's fueling this love or desire or hope for the church or the depth of spiritual life and the richness of the worship and the historicity and all of that, it has to turn from, I hate this thing that happened at this place or what they teach or whatever, and turn to, I love what's going on here. And that takes time. Like it takes time to not be like, you won't believe what they did to me there or what they said or what they teach. That's fine if that's the motivation to start the process. But you can't come into orthodoxy going, I'm here because the place I came from is horrible. You have to come, you have to come however you come, but to come into the church, like to actually come into the church, it has to be because orthodoxy is the truth, not just because we're mad at something the pastor said or the Pope or whatever. That might be the motivation to start the process, but to get into the church has to be, and the Lord will do this if you, if you let it take some time and do the work. It has to be the Lord saying, come on in, the water's fine, you know. I love what Father John said. He said, you're going to find brokenness in Orthodoxy too. Yeah, and that's, I think people run, if you're not careful, you run to the Orthodox Church saying, everything will be perfect there. I mean, and that's frankly, that's like, I don't know, I'm going to be on thin ice if you actually put this out, but like maybe you should. The, that's kind of a Protestant way to do it. You know, I'm going to go find what's, I'm going to get, I'm going to get as old, old as I can. Like I'll get the most realistic, faithful, like we'll go back to the early church or something. And they go into orthodoxy. But if you go into orthodoxy thinking now it's paradise, I mean, it's, it is pretty awesome for sure. But there's people there. So when people ask the questions like, I got hurt at these places, like, yeah, we have people that are going to yell at you over here or take your seat or 
not be nice to all the time. Although people here are actually really great, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's going to be an usher that yells at you for wanting to turn the air up or down or colder or whatever. I mean, yeah, not at our place. We have great, great usher, but, uh, yeah, he's probably going to watch this, but, uh, you know, but like some places, so it's like, yeah, you have to go and then you have to like, like stay. <laughs> you got to live a life. You got to just stay. You got to make, like, make it your place. What is your advice to a Christian who has been hurt by multiple churches? Yeah, I will just tell you the first thing that comes to mind before we actually answer the question. The first thing that comes to mind is you haven't really been hurt till you've been hurt like by a church or at a church or something. That is as much a, a, a question that shows that we, like we have an expectation that may be falsely placed. You know, we've placed somehow, like I'm gonna go to this church and again, earlier, another thing I said was like, the church is a hospital for sinners. It's where people get better. But if you go expecting everybody's already better, then you're gonna be pretty disappointed for sure. And to go to a place and say, oh, these people are sick like me, then it's like, yeah, some people are gonna bump into you and maybe the priest won't be nice to you every minute of the day somehow or say everything perfectly all the time or something like this or call every time you thought he should call you or whatever. But if you go with the sense of like, I've joined the body of Christ, you know, then you haven't like, then you, then you can, then you can be saved. Like then you can put yourself in a place for salvation, but you haven't been hurt till you've been hurt by the church. And if you're in a church long enough, you're going to get hurt by somebody or the church, like something's going to happen, you know, if you've been hurt by multiple churches, I think like, you know, that wound probably actually needs to be addressed. Like, what are you doing that this is happening? Cause you know, it's probably, forgive me, it's probably like takes two to tango a little bit on that, you know, like not everybody gets hurt by the church, but, or by churches or something. But if you've been in weird churches, kind of culty places and they've whatever made you do weird things or believe weird ways, it's like, yeah, that's why, that's why we don't stay in those places, you know. And uh, the truth of the gospel, the truth that's been handed down, revealed, and then handed down through all the generations to this moment, the truth of things doesn't hurt. It heals. It may hurt like surgery hurts, but it doesn't hurt like abuse hurts because it's not abusive. So as things are, things that are abusive are not of the truth. They're far away from it. So. We just got to put ourselves in the place where the truth is and, and trust the Lord. We don't really put our trust in men, you know, as much as we've said about spiritual fathers, once we, once we develop trust, we can trust them more, but you don't just start out thinking it's all going to be, you know, glory to glory always. And like I said, I think the truth of the teachings, what's been revealed by the Lord, handed down by the disciples to this moment, like that's for the healing of the human person, not for bashing and hurting people.